So let's restart. We are analyzing what is the output value in the case where there is congestion, where lambda is larger than C over 2. Then we have those two equations here. The first equation is explaining what happens when I have a first hop for the flow. The offered traffic is lambda. Now the ratio between capacity and offered traffic is this one. So if there is fair mixing of the packets, the output, lambda prime, is equal to the ratio multiplied by the input. So we obtain this equation here. This lambda prime that happens here is in fact the lambda prime of the previous flow. So lambda prime i minus 1, but I'm assuming complete symmetry here. All nodes, all sources are exactly the same. Equation 2 is at the second hop. If I focus at the second hop here, the offered traffic is also lambda. In fact, it's lambda of i plus 1. And lambda prime, lambda prime of i, and so we have this ratio, and lambda second gives this here. So I have two equations here. The unknowns are lambda prime and lambda second. Lambda is given, that's my input variable. C is a constant, parameter of the system. So I have to solve for those two equations. Two equations, two unknown, should be doable. It's a quadratic equation at the end, which we can solve exactly, and gives this formula here. This is the output, lambda second, as a function of lambda. Here I plotted it in the region where lambda is larger than half of the capacity, we obtain this curve here. So before that point, the whatever was given in was going out. So this is the input. And this is the output. And what we see is exactly this region is congestion collapse. We see that the output is in fact decreasing when the input increases, which is the opposite of what we would like. We have a system that is not able to sustain the work it has to do. And in that condition, it does less useful work than if it would have uh, been offered more work here. So this is exactly the definition of congestion collapse. By curiosity, you, would, you could wonder, what's the limit of that when lambda grows, when lambda goes to infinity, and with uh, Taylor expansion that is given here, you can find that the lambda second is in 1 over lambda. So it really goes to 0 when lambda goes to infinity. So that's uh, exactly what had happened in the internet in the eight, in 86, as Van Jacobson reported, but also in other, uh, it has been reported in other circumstances. And uh, if there is feedback loop, we see that not only there is inefficiency, but the more you send, in fact, the less you get at the end. So we need to do something about it. Uh, simply letting sources send as much as they would like based on the window advertised by the receiver, for example, is not a good thing. It can lead to such situations. If you have a severely congested network, having everybody send as much as they would like is less efficient than having the sources send less. In this simple example, if we would be an oracle, we would instruct every sources to send not more than C over 2, and everybody would have C over 2. Every source would be frustrated. It would have C over 2 instead of lambda, but it would be less frustrated. It would have C over 2 instead of having lambda second. So a good congestion control mechanism should provide a horizontal line here. It should send the capacity. It should allow the network to operate at its capacity and not collapse. But as we will see, uh, doing that poses a number of problems. So let's assume we are a network designer and we want to design a congestion control and we want to make it maximally efficient, avoiding the inefficiencies we've seen before here. So here's another network example. It's also a feed-forward network. There are three types of flows. One red flow that uses two links. The links are at 10 megabit per second. One blue flow that also uses the, this link here. And nine green flows that use the second link here. And assume you have complete flexibility to allocate the rates to the sources using a central controller, for example, a, a rate controller. What would be the maximal total throughput uh, in this network.
And the correct answer is 20 megabit per second. We have 10 megabit per second on this link, 10 megabit per second on that link. And we see that at least if I, we cannot get more than 20 megabits per second in total because we have, that's the sum of all the link rates. And if I let the blue flow run at 10 megabit per second, and each of the nine green flow run at 10 divided by nine, for example, then I reach that value. So 20 uh, is an upper bound and it's reachable, so it's really the max. Formally, we can do these derivations. Um, the throughput I call x0 the source, the throughput of source one, zero, x1 of the blue, x2 of the green. Now I'm assuming that all the nine green flows have the same throughput, which is not necessarily the case, but to simplify here, let me do this assumption. So we want to maximize the sum of all those th three quantities, mm -hmm. subject to the constraints of the link. Now the constraints are that all the variables are non-negative. X0 plus X1 is less than 10, that's the first link. And the second constraint is here, X0 plus 9, X2 is less than 10. You recognize a linear program that can be solved uh, with MATLAB or other tools, but as we said here, we can do it manually also. We can know that the throughput is less than 20 because it's the sum of the two here, because each of those two satisfy that. And it's achievable by this allocation. So the max is indeed 20 megabits per second. Voilà. So that's a small linear programming example. Now when we reach the maximum, what's the value of x0? None of these values. In fact, the value, the only way to reach the maximum throughput is to force x0 to 0. Intuitively, that is perhaps clear, but if we're not sure, we can do it mathematically. So we, here I'm writing the constraints on the rate that are the link here, and I'm assuming I have an allocation that achieves the maximum. So I'm asking the question, for all possible ways of achieving the maximum, what is the value of x0? Right? So those are the constraints we obtain. If we analyze this constraint, we find that necessarily we find some values for x2 that lead to this value for x0. So the only way to reach 20 megabit per second of total capacity is to force the red flow to be equal to zero. This is because the red flow uses two links. So whenever you give an epsilon of capacity to the red flow, you remove it twice from the 20, so you get less than 20. Now, what is this small example showing? Well, this small example is showing that Defining being maximally efficient is something that we need to be a bit more subtle about. Certainly maximizing the sum of the rates is not a good objective. We need something better. This is a general concept whenever you are designing a complex system where you have to allocate resources to a number of things. A simple way very often is to say I will allocate, uh, I will try to maximize the sum of the values but that very often leads to non-desirable behavior like this one here, X0 receives nothing, so your network does not work well. There's a fairness problem. In order to have a better handle of that, we need to understand what is the classical concept of efficiency, what it means to be maximally efficient in a complex system. And the, com and the concept is Pareto efficiency. So if you have a complex system that results in an allocation, I call x the collection. Here I write it as a vector. For example, think of x0, x1, x2. We say that it's maximally efficient or Pareto efficient or Pareto optimal. They mean the same. If it is impossible to increase one of the values of x without decreasing another one. So in other words, x is Pareto efficient. If for any other allocation, if I can find another allocation where I give more to I, I am forced to give less to another one. So it's, if I could give more to I without moving any other, I should do it. I'm not maximally efficient. But I am maximally efficient if I've reached a point where in order to give more to you, I have to give less to the other. 
So I've really, I'm at the limit, at the edge of the allocation. That's the formal definition of uh, Pareto efficiency. For example, in this case here, we see that we have two constraints here. And it's easy to see that Pareto efficient allocations are the ones that satisfy the two constraints with equality. Very often in realistic cases, we have a very, very large number of constraints, and very often it's not possible to satisfy all constraints together. But in this example, it is possible to satisfy all constraints together because we have independent variables. We have the blue variable that are concerned only with constraint number one, and we have the green one that are uh, concerned only with constraint number two. So it's always possible to increase the value of the blue to reach the capacity here and of the green here, there. So it's always possible to find, uh, to satisfy those constraints. So we can, with a bit of uh, simple arguments, show that the Pareto efficient allocations for this are the ones that satisfy equality here, that use the, the resources maximally. And this is a physical interpretation. An allocation is Pareto efficient if it is using the bottlenecks or the limiting resources of your system maximally. We cannot, there is no waste anywhere. So for this uh, system, which are the Pareto efficient allocations out of those three? All are Pareto efficient. They all satisfy, if you sum up x0 plus x1, you obtain 10 in all cases. And if you sum up x0 plus 9, x2, you obtain 10 also. So they're all Pareto efficient. Why do I force you to reason about this toy example? Well, this is to illustrate that the problem here, now if you're designing a congestion control, which allocation should you do? The first one, probably not, because it's shutting down the first source entirely. But how about B and C? Which one should you give? Which one is better? Is there any reason to give B rather than C? That's the question we will address now. That's the question of fairness. So if we want to be maximally efficient, that means Pareto efficient, we still have some freedom. We see here that the red are using more resources than the blue and green, and they are somehow the cause for the uncertainty of what we should do. Resolving that uncertainty forces us to reason about fairness. If you build a network, you want to give access to everyone. You want to be maximally efficient. You don't want that your network has very poor utilization of its resources, but you want to have, in some sense, fair access to all your uh, users. So the simplest version of fairness, the simplistic one, uh, sometimes called communism, uh, at least uh, it's not really communism, because in communism there was very rich people. They were not normally very rich, but were in practice were very rich. There were the members of the party. Uh, there is still in some countries. Uh, but the theory of communism is that everybody is equal. So if we go by this theory, if I have this source here, what would be the egalitarian allocation? And the solution is B. So the problem is to maximize the common value X subject to all the constraints. We force all the values to be the same, and we want to maximize it. That's egalitarianism. The constraints are 2x less than 10, 10x less than 10, so this, this first constraint is redundant. So x is less than 1, the max of x is 1. So that's it's also called water filling. We try to raise the value of everybody at the same time until we hit an impossibility. And if we do that, we have 1 megabit per second. This is not efficient. This is not Pareto efficient. If we do that, the first link here is used only at 20%. We have only two megabits here. Uh, so it's not very efficient. I could give more 
to the blue sources by doing that. I could increase the blue sources to nine instead of 10, instead of one to all. So we start from one to all, but I can increase that because if I increase this, I don't touch any of the others. And when I reach nine, I reach a point where I am Pareto efficient. Now I cannot move from that without decreasing one of the, of the sources. Well, this allocation is exactly what is called the max mean fair allocation. So egalitarian allocation doesn't make sense because it's not Pareto efficient. The egalit if we, but if we go for egalitarianism, what the concept that emerges out of that is called the max mean fair allocation. On this specific example, this is the max mean fair allocation. In general, the definition is formally as shown here. We have a vector x, that is our vector of allocation, that has to live in a space defined by the constraint of this problem. And we say that a given allocation is max mean fair if it satisfies the other criterion. If I can find another allocation that increases one of the, of the values given to one of the, of the agents or the sources here, it must decrease another one, and it must decrease another one that was not better off. So if I find an allocation where in order to increase your share, I have to take away from somebody and that somebody was not richer than you. If I'm forced to do that, I should not do it because I'm violating fairness. So if I end up in an allocation where any move I do forces me to do something unfair, then I consider that this allocation is the maximally fair, which we call the max min fair allocation. In other words, if we happen to find one such allocation, it's max min fair if any rate increase, if I try to increase the rate of somebody, I have to do it in a sense that violates fairness, in the sense that I have to take away from somebody that was having the same or less than me. If I increase your rate by taking away from somebody who's very rich, I'm improving fairness. If I can do that, I should do it. But if I cannot do it, I am at an allocation that is max mean fair. So, as you could guess now, here are two allocations. Is any of the two or the two max min fair? The majority says B, but I had leaked this information, so let's see perhaps a more convincing argument. Let's apply the definition first to allocation A, this one here. So the question is, so I'm giving zero to the red, 10 to the blue, and 10 over nine to the green. Can I increase someone without violating fairness? Well, the obvious target is X zero, that receives zero, that's the poor guy. Can I give better to X zero? Uh, yes, I can decrease X one, for example, I can give x1 gives 9, and x2 by giving 1. So I can decrease the rate of those two. In fact, I'm getting allocation b. b has increased x0, has decreased those. But the ones we have decreased were not, were having better than x0. So it's allowed to do that. So I can move from a to another allocation that is better from the sense of fairness. So a is not uh, max min fair. For allocation B, we have to try all the possible cases. If I try to increase X0, the red here, as one, the green also have one. If I try to increase X0, I have to decrease the green, because here the sum is 10. And the green had the same as X0. So to give more to the red, I need to decrease the green. But the red and the green had the same, so I'm not allowed to do that. Similarly, if I want to increase x1, which has uh, uh, x1, uh, which has 9, if I want to increase it, I have to decrease this one, which had less, so this is, we should not do it, and similarly for x2. So if we try all the possible moves to, individual moves to any of the sources, we are forced to always increase uh, another source that was less well off or the same. 
so it contradicts fairness. So this means that this is a stationary point. We cannot improve it, and it's therefore max min fair. So what we have seen about max min fairness is uh, fairly cumbersome. It's a very complicated definition. But good news, the reality is, in fact, uh, much easier. I went through this definition because it's the axiomatic one that explains where it comes from. That's the allocation we have when we want to, when we pose as axiom of fairness that we don't want to, we are forced to, uh, whenever we have to increase somebody's allocation, if we are forced to take off, take away for somebody who had less or the same, this is not okay. If we take this as definition of fairness, we lead to this, def we arrive at this definition. However, we can in practice use a number of properties of the max mean fair uh, concept. First, in any situation, in whatever the constraints, there is at most one max mean fair allocation. There are constraints where it does not exist. I invite you to read some of the references that I give in the lecture note. And there are complicated cases where there might not be a max min fair allocation. But in the type of situations where we have, where all the feasible set, the set of constraints that define the feasible values for the allocation x, is convex. If that happens, there is always a max min fair allocation, and it is unique. Fortunately, otherwise we would not use that concept. So there exists one, and it's unique. Even better, there is a concrete way to find it very easily, which is called the water filling algorithm, or the progressive filling algorithm, which works as follows. You do a number of iterations, where first you start with the, at every step, you do the egalitarian allocation. So first you give the max to everybody by forcing this max to be the same. But then you don't stop there. You stop only the sources that are hitting what is called a bottleneck. So the sources that hit the bottleneck are those that appear in constraints that are satisfied with equality. So you cannot increase them anymore because you've hit the constraint. Those sources that hit the bottleneck, you freeze them. Those are the, it's their final value. For the others, you continue an egalitarian allocation. You increase them equally until you also hit another limit. And you do that at every step. Now at every step, if there's a finite number of sources, the number of sources that are available decreases by at least one at every step. Therefore, this will stop in a, number of, in a finite number of steps. So at the end, all sources will be frozen, and the values that they have is their max min fair allocation. Let's do it for this example. Step one we do the egalitarian allocation. We have done it already. We find one, so we maximize the common value. Here it's called t, and we find one. This is what we had seen in a quiz a few minutes ago. Now, what are the sources that are frozen? Well, when we have one, here this link has a capacity of 10, so this constraint is not uh, satisfied. Here it's satisfied with equality and we look at all the sources that appear in the constraint. It's the red and the green. So at step one, the red, the red and the green are frozen to the value equal to one. So the only free variable is now the value of the blue and then we increase the blue maximally and that gives nine, which is the allocation we had found a minute ago. So this simple water filling algorithm is easy to do in practice, easy to program, so the maximum fair allocation can easily be computed. For example, in this more sophisticated scenario, I have, a bit like before, one source that uses many links and a number of local sources that use one link each and assume the capacity is the same everywhere for all the links. What is the maximum fair allocation? answer is very easy. Here, it's we do water filling, so we increase the capacity to every... Uh, and in the first step, we find C over 2, so that's a very simple case where everything stops in one step. I use this example because this will give me a motivation for going beyond max mean fairness. Right. 
Things would be very easy if everybody would agree that max min fairness is the ideal uh, definition of fairness. It is used in a number of mechanisms. For example, in rate allocation mechanisms in metropolitan or local area networks that use active rate control, they tend to use uh, max min fair allocation. However, some people are criticizing uh, a bit the max min fair allocation. For example, in the previous example that was here, it made a lot of sense. Uh, whoops, I'm going the wrong side. Here, the max min fair allocation makes a lot of sense. It is trying. Uh, this allocation that I find here makes a lot of sense. I'm trying, I'm making everybody happy, maximally happy, starting from the egalitarian allocation. But if I apply this to this example, we see that we have the red connection that uses four hops, each of the blue uses one hop, and they get the same. So if we would try to maximize the total throughput, we would give zero to the red, and that would not be good. By being max min fair, we go the other extreme, where we give the same to the red and the blue, and some people <coughs> could contend that this is not fair, because in some sense, the red is using more of the network resources. You should not, not shut it down, but it's okay to give it less than to the blue, because the blue is uh, using less of the network. That leads to the, if we go in that direction, the theoretical concept is called proportional fairness. So the bad thing about fairness is that there are essentially two definitions of fairness, and as we will see, the internet is somewhere in bit playing in between. So the axiomatic definition is very similar to the max min fair allocation, but it uses relative uh, values instead of absolute values. That's the major definition. That's why it's called proportionally fair. So the setting is the same. I have a vector x, and I'm assuming here that the allocations are always positive, because I will divide by x. And I'll say that it is proportionally fair if any deviation, x prime, must have a global balance that is negative, where the global balance is equal to the sum of the relative changes. In max min fair allocation, we did not consider the relative values. We considered uh, the true values. In proportional fair, we put relative values to play. So this thing here is saying, when I, if I have an allocation that's Pareto efficient, we know that in order to increase the rate of someone, we need to decrease the rate of someone else. So if I start from a Pareto efficient allocation, this terms here will be negative for some i and positive for some i. And I say that I've reached an equilibrium, the best thing in terms of fairness, if any change forces me to have negative things. So in average, I'm making things worse if I put, take the average of the changes that everybody has. If I find a point where this is true, then I am at the equilibrium point in the sense of fairness. Of course, what I should have mentioned uh, about the max min fair allocation is that the max min fair allocation is obviously Pareto efficient. Pareto efficient means that in order to increase someone, I have to decrease someone else. If I have a max min fair allocation, in order to increase someone, I must decrease someone else. And in, in fact, I must also decrease someone else who has less or the same as the one I'm increasing. So all those fairnesses of course, it leads to Pareto efficient allocations. Otherwise, we would not be interested. So this definition of proportional fairness means that the rate of change must be negative for any deviation from this one here. So it has two effects. I mean, first, and the most important one, is it's relative shares that matter. If I have one source that has one gigabit per second, the other has one kilobit per second, the increase if I add one kilobit per second for the source that had one kilobit, then it doubles its rate, so it's a huge increase. If I reduce from one gigabit to one gigabit minus one kilobit, then the decrease is minuscule, so it's negligible. So I should do such an increase, which maximum fairness, I might perhaps not do it here. So we consider that it's the relative change uh, shares that matter, not the absolute. 
And second, because we integrate, we take the sum, we also take into account the global effect. So if a source uses many, many links, by decreasing a bit, I might increase a large number of other sources. So I will do it, and that uh, is the desirable property. Here are two allocations that we have seen before in two different network scenarios. Are these allocations proportionally fair? And there's a tie between C and D. Let's see where the solution is. So let's examine allocation A first. So A gives the same to the red and all the blue. So can I deviate somehow? Well, the intuition is the red should get perhaps a bit less because it's using more. So let's try, let me try to decrease the red and increase the blue. So I increase the blue by delta. Then I have to decrease, if I give an a delta more to the blue, I have to subtract it from the, from the red because that happens exactly uh, in this way at every constraint here. And if the delta is small, then in fact larger than C over 2, that should be a feasible allocation. So for any delta that's less than C over 2, I can increase the blue by this delta and decrease the red. Now what is the total rate of change? Well, the blue, the, the red one has a negative minus delta divided by C over 2, and the blue have a positive, the same, but there are four blues. So it's multiplied by 4 if I take the integral of all the rate of changes. This is positive. So I can deviate from this allocation such that the sum of the delta, is, the relative delta, is positive. If I can do that, it means this allocation is not the proportionally fair allocation. So A is not proportionally fair. For B, it's a bit more complicated, but it's exactly the same. Uh, I can x2, uh, x2, uh, sorry, x0, which is receiving 1, which is the same as the green, but is using 2, so 2 hops. I can increase the green and decrease the red. So if I increase the green by delta, I have to decrease the red by 9 delta, so now delta has to be small less than uh, uh, ten, uh, 1 over 9. But then the new allocation is feasible, and the total rate of change is, if we do the math, is positive. So it is also not the proportionally fair allocation. So the proportionally fair allocation is a bit more tricky. However, there is also a simple uh, rule. If the set of constraints for the rates is convex, then the properly fair allocation exists and is unique, and it's obtained by maximizing the sum of the logarithms. Why the logarithms? Well, because intuitively, if I am at a point x and I look at what is the small variation of that, when I move a bit from x, then by the law of derivative, we obtain that the variation of this is the integral term that we had used in the definition of proportional fairness. So intuitively, if I maximize the sum of the log, this function j, at the point where there's the maximum, in any direction that I go, a small change will lead to this being negative because I am at the maximum. Any deviation away from the maximum results in a delta being negative. This is a bit hand-waving argument. To make it uh, strictly true, you need to exploit the fact that j is a concave function. And uh, the detailed derivation is in the lecture notes. But for us, that's the take-home message. I mean, first, like for maximum fairness, it exists and is unique. Otherwise, probably we would not use such a theory. And second, computing it is at least in theory simple. All we need is to solve a convex optimization problem, which consists in maximizing a concave function, which is the logarithm, the sum of the logarithm. 
And of course, because the logarithm is a monotonic function, if we increase, if we maximize this, the result is Pareto efficient. Because when the sum of the log is maximum, if I try to increase one of the rates, I must increase its log also. So if the sum of the log is maximum, I must decrease the log of another source, which means decrease also the x of another source. So the proportionally fair allocation is Pareto efficient here. Now it's a bit less easy than the maximum fair allocation because we have to solve a non-linear optimization problem. Let's do it for this example here, where I have one red source that we believe should get less than the same as the blue. So let's do that and see what it gives. So I have to maximize u. We can think of u or j as a utility function. So we're maximizing a global utility of the network, which is the sum of the log of the rates. So log of x0 plus etc. subject to all those constraints here. So before we dive into that, uh, an intuition for why the logarithm comes is also when I am maximizing the log, what matters is the relative changes. I mean, if your value is one gigabit per second or one kilobit per second, a small change for the guy who have a small rate means, uh, I mean, because the log is concave, if your value of x is very large, in order to increase the log, you need to increase the x also by a large amount, which means in relative terms, perhaps the same, but in absolute value by a large amount. So this is what proportional fairness is capturing. So let's go through that here. Uh, we could use Groby or MATLAB to solve it, but here there's a direct solution because here the constraints are separable. We know that in every constraint there is a free variable, so obviously if we look at the constraint that is here, we should force equality in the constraint by giving the maximum value to the blue source. Voila, time's out. So we'll come back to this solution of this convex program next week. See you tomorrow. <laughs>